morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Bay and her husband had been forced into a working camp by the North Korean government because a Bible was found in their home. They were given minimal food rations around 6 a.m. in the morning and then off to a full day of arduous work. If the quota isn't met, they're punished. Hunger grows in the pit of Bay's stomach throughout every day. During breaks, she sneaks off into the woods to forage for some wild mushrooms, barely enough to starve off, to fend off starvation. Finally, at dusk, when the day is done, they get some watery soup, and if lucky, some rice, and back to her home. She waits for the moon to go behind the clouds and then slips out into the night quietly so her neighbors don't hear, back into the forest, this time not to pillage for food, but rather to retrieve a hidden Bible. Putting it under her cloak, she returns back to the house, shades drawn, and around candlelight, her husband reads, barely above a whisper, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, it's another day in the life of the North Korean church. Put yourself in this context and consider how magnificent the patient resolve of the Holy Spirit to strengthen and to encourage day in, day out under such conditions. This morning, we will continue our walk through the fruit of the Spirit on to the fourth one, patience. Patience. Listen as I read in Galatians 5, picking up in verse 19. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissension, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you. And just I has, has I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, as we continue to walk through the the fruit of the Spirit and read about your character, who you are, the foundation that overflows from you, and as your Spirit indwells us, help us, please, God, we pray, to become like you, that your character becomes our character that it overflows in life, (laughs) that this idea of patience seeps deep into our soul, that we would cry out with the psalmist, I will wait for you. I will wait for you, God. You are my delight. You are better. And you will sustain and we trust you. We trust you in every trial, in every up and down, in every season of life. We trust you and we will wait for you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so guys, let's, let's be honest. When we hear the word patience, okay, most often we think about the little annoying inconveniences of our day, all right, like being stuck in traffic. Or you you turn the corner at H-E-B only to find that every line is out into the aisles. And you're like, don't fail me now, Jesus. I need you in this moment. Last week, I went on a mission trip to Yucatan. 
In Mexico, there is no such thing as fast food. Okay, we waited for an hour and a half as a group for church's chicken. And catch this, they only have 3G internet for your phones. I mean, talk about suffering for the Lord. So we have a saying for these type things. We call them, that, that's a first world problem. When the reality is, is we've become spoiled to a very easy, convenient lifestyle. But the biblical idea of patience, that you need the Holy Spirit to produce patience in you, is light years from the illustrations that I've just given. Adoniram Judson, the first Baptist missionary called by God to take the gospel to the Burmese people amidst great cost, left his home his extended family, everything he knew for a foreign land would never see his parents again. Only months after leaving the United States, he would lose his financial backing and be separated from his other missionary team to be isolated. Judson would be imprisoned and tortured for almost two years for suspicion of being a spy during the Burmese Civil War. He would have to grieve the death of three wives and seven children while on the field. It was six years before his first convert. After 12 years, he only saw 18 conversions. At one point, he was so depressed under the anguish of his situation, he dug his own grave and sat there for weeks contemplating just lying down in it. See, now that's a much weightier idea of the fruit of patience. There are two really important biblical ideas behind the word patience that we will look at this morning. Patience with the trials of life and patience with other people. That first one, Long-suffering, patience with the trials of life. The word translated patience here literally means long-tempered. In many of our older English translations, it was translated long-suffering. The ability to endure and persevere against suffering without becoming bitter or discouraged. Abraham and Sarah lived for decades with Sarah's barrenness. And then at the age of 75, they received the promise, Abraham received the promise that Sarah would have a son, only to have to wait 25 more years for his birth. How did they overcome discouragement? The fruit of long-suffering. Joseph was enslaved in Egypt 13 years during the prime of his life, mistreated, falsely accused, forgotten. How did he overcome bitterness? The fruit of long suffering. You see, naturally, our, our flesh it gravitates towards ease and comfort and safety. In our culture, the most prosperous economy in the history of the world has ever seen, certainly markets towards all that you deserve in life and have it your way and you should have your best life now. Friend, if we're going to take the Bible seriously, we have to see that the Bible paints a completely different picture about life. Jesus says, take up your cross if you are to follow me. That all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This world is not your home. Stand firm because life is war. You need to take up God's armor daily in order to fend off the spiritual warfare that will come against you. First Peter, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeals that come against you as if something strange were happening to you. The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. 
Listen to Hebrews 10, 36. You have need of endurance. You have need of endurance. Do you believe that God wants to produce the fruit of love in your life? The Holy Spirit inside of you, that God wants his fruit and that it should produce love in your life. We would all say, yes. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit wants to produce the fruit of joy in your life? Yes. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit wants to produce the fruit of peace in your life? Do you believe the Holy Spirit wants to produce the fruit of long suffering in your life? That his character would be our character? This is a spiritual quality, this patience that, if we're honest, is elusive. Guys, if we're honest, it's downright impossible without the Holy Spirit's help. Just look at how prosperous we are and yet how easily discouraged, how easily we quit. Right there with Job's wife. Why don't we curse God and die? Oftentimes this long suffering is at the hands of another person. Someone in authority, a family member, even a person who has inflicts ridicule, harsh rebuke, scorn, abuse, even persecution. Just last week, I told you a story that in Mexico about a family that uh, uh, did not have the money to pay a gang and they were threatening to kidnap family members. I know all across this room, there are many women who have suffered abuse by domineering husbands. Kids who've, who've endured unspeakable horrors by an authority figure over them. Church, it is not wise for me to speak on such a delicate subject and paint with such a broad brush. So as your pastor right now, I'm, I'm tasked with, with walking a narrow, delicate line to to be able to choose my words. So I I need you to listen. I also need you you to give me grace because I, I only have time to say a few things. And most situations need personal counseling. They need personal wisdom. If you are in a situation of abuse, physical or extreme mental abuse, get out. Get safe. Get help. You hear me? Far too many women have suffered unjustly because they've been poorly counseled by pastors to sit back and take it like Jesus did. You may be aware of the recent findings in the Southern Baptist Convention about at the leadership at the top that was minimizing cases of abuse and at times covering it up. And as your pastor, let me say I'm absolutely disgusted, horrified by the lack of empathy and support for those who had the courage to come forward. The Bible teaches that the people of God are to be a refuge, to protect and to fight for the most vulnerable. Those trampled on by society should find safe haven with the church. I've been delayed in my response to you. At times, I've sat down, started to write a letter, but if I'm honest, I've been disheartened by some of the ongoings in the Southern Baptist Convention, and I wanted to see what would happen at the latest convention. I am happy to report that that all uh, all the improvements recommended have been adopted by the SBC, and, and I hope that we as a convention do a lot better moving forward. Back to the personal. A Christian is is never called to, to seek out suffering. 2 Corinthians 12, Paul 
prays three times for the thorn in his flesh to be removed. He prays. He asks for that. First Corinthians 7, Paul tells slaves, if you can be free, become free. Certainly, Joseph would have gladly received his freedom any time that it was given instead of being enslaved for 13 years. And yet, because this world is not our home, the Christian often finds himself in suffering, mistreated by others, and in a situation that is beyond control. That in that moment, for some reason, God in his wisdom and sovereignty has allowed it. He has not caused it, but he has allowed it. And he has not allowed a way of escape, but rather he promises strength to bear up under and endure in the midst of. Think of how often Christ's church has been persecuted. You can read it right there in your New Testament and all the way up until the 20th century, which had more martyrs than the previous 19 together. Situations like this may seem extreme in comparison to most of us, to what most of us will encounter. But you will encounter situations where you are mistreated and completely powerless to escape, where you will be forced to endure injustice. And your ability to overcome, to find strength that comes from God alone and rise up will be a testimony to a world which also suffers. In fact, 1 Peter 2.21, the scripture says that God calls Christians to this purpose, the purpose of at times suffering unjustly and bearing it just like Christ as a witness to the world. When Paul prayed three times for that thorn of, in his flesh to be removed, God replied, my grace is sufficient for you. So how does the Holy Spirit produce Patience, long-suffering, the ability to endure and persevere without becoming bitter or overwhelmed with discouragement. Four quick lessons that I think we can learn from David's life when he was on the run from King Saul for probably seven years at least, betrayed, alone, hiding in caves and in the wilderness. Four lessons as you comb through the Psalms. You say, where is some salve for my soul? What can I hold on to? Number one, God is near. God is near. Listen to Psalm 18. The cords of death encompassed me and the torrents of ungodliness terrified me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and I cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry for help before him. It came into his ears. I know it doesn't always seem like it. But God draws near. He has promised. He draws near. He hears those who are mistreated. When you comb through Joseph's story, you find that God was with him for those 13 years when he was enslaved. That time and time again, David, even though he cried out and even though he had anguish in his soul, he continually found God in the midst of the trial. And you must too, or you will be overwhelmed by sorrow. You will be overwhelmed by sorrow. Cry out with David as he did in Psalm 69, 69 answer me, O Lord. For your loving kindness is good. According to the greatness of your compassion, turn to me and do not hide your face from your servant. You have to cry out to the Lord in the midst of the pain and long suffering. And in the darkest of nights, stare at the cross, meditate on the cross that Jesus long suffered for you.
Secondly, God will bring justice. When life was sweepingly unfair, how is it that David did not take revenge against Saul whenever he had opportunity? Do you, do you remember? David was in the cave and Saul went in there to him and he did not know that David was there and he could have taken his life right then. How is it that David did not seek revenge? Because he knew that God would judge. That there is a day coming soon when every enemy will have to stand before God and will give an account. Because David remembered that God is just and that God hated the injustice even more than he did, a thousand times more than David did. Listen to me. You must be able to meditate on this truth. God hates the sin and the injustice that has come against you a thousand times more than you do. And there is a day when all will come to light, when all will be judged, and everything will be made right. You have to be able to trust that. You have to be able to meditate on God as the supreme judge and you get out of the judgment seat. Whether you know it or not, whenever bitterness starts to set into your soul, you have crept into the judgment seat. And it's not that an injustice hasn't happened to you. It's that you can't handle it. And you will become bitter and it will consume you. You must trust that God will judge, that all authority is given to him and get out of the judgment seat. This is what Jesus means whenever he requires that you love your enemy, that you forgive your enemy. It, it is not that, that you say, that didn't hurt or that was okay. No, 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 listen. It is for you to say, God, you are the judge. I am not. I will come down. It's the only way you can have victory, friend. Number three, do not walk in isolation. David's lowest points were when he felt utterly alone and he felt like he had to bear the full weight of his suffering alone. In the darkness of the cave, he said, no one cares for my soul. It was a lie, a lie from the pit of hell. That no one cares for your soul. Listen to Galatians 6 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Reality is, is all across this room right now, there are those who are long suffering, who feel like they are, that they are struggling because they are bearing the weight of all of that on their own. They are in isolation and they fear to speak up because they don't want to be a killjoy and they don't want to be a burden on others. Let the people of God distribute that weight. Do not walk alone. The devil longs to get you alone, to isolate you, and to lie to you. Let me say this, church. Church, we are called to come alongside, to enter in, to help carry. Not to just come and give 30-second pep talks that say, just cheer up. Walk alongside. And number four, there is hope, my friend, because we win in the end. The sorrow will last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. David long suffered under the hand of Saul, but then he became king. God did not waste his suffering. Joseph long suffered for 13 years without freedom, presumed to be dead by his family. But then God rose him up to the number two in all of Egypt and brought salvation through him. You see, God did not waste his suffering. Adoniram Judson long suffered to bring the gospel to the Burmese people. But when his life was finished, 
Do you realize he had planted more than 100 churches and there were 8,000 professing Christians in Burma and today more than 6 million. God did not waste his suffering. Jesus patiently endured death, even death on a cross. But on the third day, God rose him from the dead. So hear me, God will not waste your suffering. He has promised. You see, to be patient, to long suffer, is to genuinely believe. As God has promised, he will cause all things to work together for my good, and it will be glorious in the end. That you will win that he will not waste one ounce of suffering. The second biblical idea behind the fruit of patience is to be patient with other people. Forbearance. The ability to put up with the weaknesses and faults of others without being quick-tempered. Now, we don't have an English equivalent Okay, we, we say short-tempered. The literal translation is long-tempered here, meaning slow to anger. Remember in Exodus 34, when Moses asked God, show me your glory. Remember that account? Beforehand, we're told, God says to Moses, listen, you, you can only see my back. I will put my hand, you will only be able to see my back. But in Exodus 34, when the actual account happens, and you say, well, well what did Moses see? You don't, you don't ever find out. All you're told in the account is that God passes by and God declares his name to Moses. That's the account. That's what you get in, in Exodus 34. God declares his name. And listen to what he says. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, Yahweh, the Lord God, Yahweh Adonai, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. That God is slow to anger. God himself, this is his name. I am slow to anger. Have you ever asked, when should justice be dispensed? When should you catch a thief? If someone murders your family, when do you want them punished? Well, the answer is immediately. Absolute justice is without delay. And yet when Adam sinned, God did not give immediate death. Instead, he rolled out a plan of redemption because he's slow to anger. When you sin, God does not give immediate justice. Rather, he is slow to anger. In fact, the Bible is filled with example after exa example of how patient God is, that he is exceedingly slow to anger. In Genesis 15, when God tells Abraham, he's making a promise to Abraham a hundred years prior, he's telling him, I'm going to give your descendants this land. But in Genesis 15, he tells them, he says, listen, your descendants are going to become slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Why is that? Well, the text says, God says, because the sins of the Amorites are not yet complete. You pause and think about that for a second. God is going to give Israel this land that he has prepared. It's the promised land. He has prepared for them, for his children. And he sets his children aside for 400 years because he's not yet ready to judge the Amorites. He knows the Amorites will not repent and that he will come a day when he brings judgment upon them that the others in the land, he's ready to judge them, but he's not yet ready to judge the Amorites and he sets his own children aside for 400 years 
because he's slow to anger. Another radical scene. God tells his prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute because that is a picture of his people towards him. And then he tells his prophet, continue to pursue her because that's how he is towards his people. God is painting the picture, describing the illustration, and he paints himself as a cuckold husband, chasing a people who continually run away because God is slow to anger. Jesus is the clearest picture of God, the exact radiance of his presence. And Jesus repeatedly shocks the religious crowd because he is a friend of sinners. One day a woman is caught in adultery, caught in the very act. They bring her to Jesus. They declare, the law says we must stone her. What say you? He gets down in the dirt. Whatever he scribbles runs everyone off. He lifts her head, says, where are your accusers? And without excusing her sin, because he is slow to anger, he says, darling, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Jesus is slow to anger. The night of his betrayal, in the upper room with the disciples, how long he had walked with them and trained them, you would think they would get some of these things. They don't. There isn't a slave, a servant at the door to wash their feet. They walk in, in their minds think, huh, whoever put this party together didn't remember the doorman. And they all sit down. All gospels narrate that their conversation leading up to and all around has all been about who is the greatest in the kingdom. And the son of God who is about to drink the wrath of the cup of God for our sins, gets up, girds himself as a servant and washes his disciples' feet, even Judas. To encounter the grace, the patience, the slowness to anger of the love of God is to forever be changed by it. Amen. Forever. And so the question this morning is, are we like him in the way that we deal with other people? Right here at church, or at your work, or within your family, in your home, are you slow to anger? Are you patient? Do you forbear even others' sins? Or are you like Jonah? Remember Jonah? Jonah is a in-your-face Bible story. Because in Jonah chapter 1, God says, go. And Jonah says, no, I don't like those people. Now, in fairness, they were really wicked. And so Jonah runs the other way. 
But in Jonah chapter two, what you realize is that in the midst of the storm, God saves Jonah. God is patient with Jonah. God is slow to anger. He is exceedingly grace-filled to Jonah. After he gets spit back up on the land, chapter three, it's, all right, now it's time to go to Nineveh. Jonah goes and preaches. Repent. Judgment is near. Repent. And they do. In Jonah chapter four, God sits, uh, sorry, in Jonah chapter four, Jonah sits outside the city and laments. And he says, I knew you were slow to anger. I knew it. I'm so mad. You are slow to anger, God, and I want you to just smite them. And that's how the book ends. With this picture of God slow to anger and the people of God angry and bitter. May that never be said of us. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. That his character would be in us. Not only to trust him and to endure suffering in our own lives, but to be patient and forbearing with others, even in their sin. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, you are not like us. Your character and your mercy and your goodness that you desire to be glorified by your grace and your patience, the fact that you are waiting even still to return so that others might come to salvation and repentance in you. God, give us that Produce it in us that we would trust you, that we would sit, that we would long for you and that you would fill our soul even while we endure, even while we go through hardship and trial. And that that would produce a glorious picture that we would be like you that we would be like you, Jesus, and that the world would see a weight, a heaviness, a staying power, a perseverance to our faith, that we would still be filled with love, joy, peace, even in the midst of the trials, that we would be patient with others. Please, God. We cry out right now. We declare we need you. We cannot do that on our own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.